going to be continuing our series today on Acts. Hello, good morning. My sermons always seem, or my messages, I think, are starting to, um, they do make my husband a little nervous because they're a little different than what he usually shares on, but that's why we're married. <laughs> <laughs> Got good stuff, and so do I. <laughs> so I'm so excited to be sharing with you today, and I have a lot to pack in to a short period of time. So I'm going to um, jump right in. We're in keeping with our series on Acts, which we started last week. We're going to be reading this morning from Acts 2, verses 17 through 19. Acts 2, verses 17 through 19. It reads, "In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Holy Spirit on all people." Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women will prophesy, and I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. So let's pray. Father, I thank you that you're in this place with us right now. I ask that you would move on us by your Holy Spirit so that we can move in you. Lord, you know that there is a, a quivering in my soul. And Father, I want your word to be brought forth, not mine. And so Father, I pray for your strength, for your courage, and for your power. And Father, I pray that you would renew us by your Holy Spirit, that you would um, bring restoration to our souls, to, to Lord our spirit, those of us who've fallen from you or fallen away from you, maybe you're, you don't seem so close these days. So Father, would you restore? I ask that you would bring healing today, Lord, in a wide array of areas. Lord, just, just bring, Father, all that you have planned and more, Father, we ask for more that you would do, do it all, Lord, whatever you have for this time, that you would be here in this place and speak to every single person. And I pray that you would minister to us by not only your spirit, but by your angels. And we thank you for this time. Amen. So this is a very powerful piece of scripture, and I love it. But as I was reading this chapter 2, I said, Lord Jesus, what do you want me to speak on? There's so much I could share. And he reminded me very quickly, he said, keep sharing your story. Keep sharing your testimony. And I said, okay. And um, so I'm going to kind of take from that scripture the part about dreaming dreams. And with dreams sometimes comes prophetic as well. So that's where we're going to go today. And um, before I dig into this message, I just want to say quickly that this uh, message is not meant to elevate dreams to an unhealthy place. We are to be God seekers first, not dream seekers. God speaks to us in his word. He speaks to us in prayer. But he does speak to us in dreams. And it's my hope that I can remind some of you that he's still in that business. <coughs> He still can speak to us in that way, okay? And so we wouldn't read the Bible without proper discernment, nor would we approach dreams any differently. So let's get started. Many early Christian writers to modern day believers agree that God still reveals himself through dreams. He's still doing that. He did it in the Word, and he still does it in modern times. Lord hinted towards this last week that many... Muslims are starting to receive dreams from Christ. He's appearing to them and they're converting, as well as Jews. I don't know if you said that last week, but Jews and Muslims are starting to convert more now than ever because of dreams from Christ. And three examples, um, Josephus, Augustine, Constantine, are three very famous examples of individuals who grew in their faith or even converted to Christianity because of dreams from God. Okay, so God continues to move in that way. In Psalm 121, it says that as I lift my eyes to the mountains, my help comes from the maker of heaven and earth, who watches over me and does not sleep 
or slumber. So what that tells us is that God is always awake. He is always able to speak to you anytime. He doesn't need that restoration sleep that we need. He is always powerful. And he's always wanting to communicate. And so I've been praying for you guys over the last three weeks. And I've been praying that God would give you dreams. And so I'd like to ask you, if not just in the last three weeks, but in your lifetime, could you raise your hand if you believe God has given you a dream that helped you in a situation, helped you maybe alter what you were going to do, caused you to do something different that you wouldn't have done? Could you raise your hand if you've ever received a dream? Raise them up. Dream from God. Okay. So those of you who are raising your hand, I'm not going to ask you to come forward. But if I asked you if you would be willing to share one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one with, with an individual who was interested, your testimony, would you share it? Could you please stand? Praise God. Right? A lot of testimonies in this room. Okay, so you all who are sitting down, look around. Look at those people who are standing up. Grab them after the service. Have some coffee with them one day. Say, I want to hear that story. And I'm not going to remember probably most of you standing up, but I want to hear all the stories. Okay, so you can sit down. Thank you. So let's take a quick biblical um, background look at dreams. And uh, in your next steps, you'll notice that I had put some scripture in there. Now, most of that scripture are specifically dreams from God. There's only two that are visions because it's in some translations they say dreams, some they say visions. But most people hold to the thought that night visions and dreams are pretty much one and the same because they accomplish the same purpose from God. He reveals um, images or a message and it causes the person to respond. Okay, so night visions, dreams. If I had included all the night visions, we would be here probably for the rest of the day talking about all of this, okay? So I tried to keep mostly with dreams. And in the dreams from God, he has four basic, what I see as four basic purposes to a dream, okay? And sometimes they're joined together, sometimes they're separate. And the first purpose is prophetic. Okay, God gives a dream for prophetic to show us what is going to come a year from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and even in the Word of God, hundreds of years. The prophet Joel, which we read, was hundreds of years to happen in the future of the Messianic age. So prophetic purposes. And some of the um, scripture that uh, relates to this is Genesis 28, when Jacob saw the stairway to heaven. Genesis 37 to 41, when Joseph and the Pharaoh and the bread maker and the wine server, they had a boatload of prayers in there that story. Daniel 7 with Daniel's dreams. And then there's another type of dream that God gives us, and that's directional. Sometimes he gives us dreams for direction, a kind of a do-it-now emphasis. You will have to respond to it in the next 24, 48 hours. Some examples of that is Judges 7 and Gideon's dream, Matthew 1 and 2, Joseph the father of Jesus, he gave him three dreams. Acts 9 with Ananias and Acts 10 with Cornelius. Still other dreams offer blessing or a calling from God. In 1 Kings, Solomon's dream is God imparts to him the blessing of wisdom. In 1 Samuel, God calls to Samuel to be his servant. And lastly, God gives us dreams to expose sin. So sometimes that can be a sin in someone else or the sin going on in your own life. And an example of that is in Genesis 20, the story of Abimelech, when he realizes that Sarah is not Abraham's sister, but his wife, which was very important to know. <laughs> so, it's clear that God used dreams in the Bible. And in Acts 2 that we read, it says that he will continue to use them when in the messianic age to come which is now so these things are to fall on you you are to prophesy you are to dream dreams you are to see signs and wonders you are to do all of these things he's talking about you okay so this is about us so some of you may be wondering well what how do i know 
if a dream is from God or not? And that's a great question. And I've come up with a list of just four types of dreams that we just have. Okay, they're not all God dreams, but they're four types of dreams that we have. And the first type of dream we have is a soul dream. Soul dreams. Which come from our emotions and the day-to-day -day activities. In Ecclesiastes 5.3 it says that our dreams come from the busyness of our lives. And most of these dreams are reenactment, reenactments of our day, the ambitions um, projected into dreams, all the information that we've kind of been shoving into our brain and just processing out. The second kind of dream that we could have is a stimulant dream. Okay, and so these dreams come from prior to bed, if you drink coffee, if you uh, eat spicy food, what you are ingesting, medications, what you're taking into your body also, as well as your mind, your gaming, you're reading a book before bed, you're watching a movie before bed, you might, it might stimulate the type of dream you have because you just did it right before going to bed. The third type of dream are satanic dreams. These are nightmares. I would also include sleep paralysis and night terrors into this category. And these type of dreams create an absence of God, okay? A hopelessness, a despair. Um, there's no God involved in this, okay? And the, the fourth, and so I just, if I could, just take a step away from the list. If you are someone who is experiencing these type of dreams on a, on a chronic level, I would just suggest that you get yourself up, that you physically get yourself up. It says that in the word that if you call on the name of Christ, standing firm in your faith, and, and cry out to Jesus that, that, he, that the devil has to resist being with you and he has to leave. Okay, so that's the first thing. Call on the name of Christ if you were in that fearful, terrifying place. But some people just stop there. They say, you know, whatever was going on, it left. I called on Jesus. But I would say take it a step further, especially if you have this going on on a regular basis. And I'm not speaking about something that's just random. The reason why I'm pulling this out is because I hear about it all the time. Okay? So um, the next thing I would suggest is that you pray for protection. You, you ask God, just protect my, my home, you know, my, my room. Um, watch over us, Lord. And then, um, <clears throat> secondly, I think it's important to confess. And sometimes when you're in that place, um, I, I, had, I won't go into the story, but I just remember there was one time where one of my children were having a night terror and we could not wake our child up. And God revealed to me something I had done. And I said, Jesus, I'm sorry. Whew, it was gone. And so sometimes I think we have to go to a place of confession. That maybe we brought something on to put us in that place of nightmare, of, of sleep paralysis, of, of um, night terrors. And then um, the fourth type of dream would be Holy Spirit, spirit dreams. Okay? Holy Spirit, dreams from God. They will reflect God's purposes, his character, sometimes his word. God's dreams are very clear. They're not hazy or confusing, but they're very vivid and memorable. Often there's a sense of a complete thought, even though you know Jesus spoke in parables, sometimes your dreams come across as like a night parable. So they have like images or symbols. So sometimes they can have just um, an oddness to them, um, but they're from God. And in Job 33, 14 through 18, it says, For God speaks in a dream, in a vision of the night when deep sleep falls on people as they slumber in their beds. He may speak in their ears and terrify them with warnings to turn them from wrongdoing and keep them from pride, to preserve them from the pit or death their lives from perishing by the sword. So God's dreams warn, they turn, they keep, they preserve. Okay, this is marking a strong contrast between satanic dreams of despair, hopelessness, no God, okay, to God having a purpose within it, even though it may come across as somewhat uncomfortable or even terrifying. You have a call. There's something to be done with you 
in it. So at this time, I'd like to share with you a few dreams of my own. This is testimony time. And I do want to say, if you have any children in here who are ultra sensitive, I just want to forewarn that maybe a couple of these dreams might um, not be good for them. If they were my kids, I mean, we exposed our kids to, to so much, and we just talked, we were kind of about talking through it. I mean, I figure if Goliath's getting his head chopped off in a story, then maybe, you know, we can go there with our kids. But you, you be the judge of it, okay? So, um, <coughs> Uh, this first story that I wanted to share took place my freshman year in college. And there's a slide that will come up, and this is some friends of ours, and we're worshiping in my dorm room, and you see that big boom box, you know? <laughs> we didn't have those little shuffles that you guys have now. It was about as small as we could get at that time. But. So we're worshiping in there, and the guy sitting across from me is a guy that I started to date. And I just wanted to share this dream in particular because I know there's a lot of people in this room who are in that stage in life where you're wondering if you're going to get married or if the person that you're with is the one um, who you should be getting married to. And so I thought this would be a good story to share. So um, I was not expecting to date my freshman year in college because I really didn't want to. Okay, I was focused on ministry. I was like, it's, I'm all in for you, God. I don't want that relationship stuff, but it just happened. And um <laughs> My freshman year, I met this guy, and he was a talented young young man, a Christian, um, smart, so forth. And so we were going into the summer. He was coming to visit my family, and I took relationships very seriously. I'm like, if we're going to get into a relationship, we are getting married. That's the way I thought about it, okay? We go out with people, and then we go out for a few meals, but we are going to get married. And so I knew that we were crossing over that line, of decision. And I was just really just not knowing. And I said, God, I need to know. You know, is he the one? I need to hear from you because I really don't know. Because I was having in my mind to decide that, the, that my future was not going to maybe go the way that I had thought. I might have to transfer schools. I might get pregnant in a couple years, whatever, you know. So I had to totally do a shift in my mind and be willing to accept that if God wanted that. And so I was crying out to him. He was coming to visit my family one day in the summer, and I had a dream. I had a dream the night before he arrived. And in that dream, I was in my wedding gown. And I was standing at the end of the aisle, and it was a long aisle, and at the end of the aisle, I could see the groom and the groom's men. Couldn't see their faces. It was totally blurred out because I didn't need to see them. But what I did see was their body, their bodies. And the groom had a short body. <laughs> But this fellow was 6'3. He was the captain of the football team, big guy. Okay. So he was, I knew it wasn't him. He was not at the end of the aisle. And I woke up. As soon as I saw that, I woke up and I said, It's not him. <laughs> He's not the one. And not only did I have revelation, I had a peace. I was like, It's not him. I'm okay with that. Whereas before, I was like, Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the only di uh, discomfort that I had is I had to tell him. <laughs> you know? But he was a man of God, and he took it gracefully, and so we did end that relationship. But sadly, two years later, he passed away in a car crash. Uh. Yeah. And so I do believe that God can use dreams to give us directions about people he wants us to talk to or pray with. God knows the future, and he may be warning you about something that you cannot see, only to protect you or someone else. And if I had a quote for, from me, from Betty, for this sermon, I would say that it is never outside of God's character to pray about a dream. It's never outside of his character to pray through a dream that you've had. And I would say I would love for us to be more in the habit of doing that. Because I think often, I'm just going to have, if I have a dream and I wake up and it's about anyone, Julie or Jacob, I'll just start praying for them. And I may not understand why, but does it hurt to pray for them? No, okay. So it's really, I think I would love for us to get in the habit of just taking our dreams to prayer. Okay? Um, this next dream has to do with a good friend of mine. I don't have any slides for this, but... Um, 
this was probably over 15 years ago. She was a dear friend of mine who was very talented, but she was very stifled in it, and she was a fearful, anxious person. And she had a really hard time sharing anything about her past. You know, whenever she talked, she was okay with talking about um, things in the present and a little in the future, but she was just so, it was like she had a shackle around her, her, her throat when it came to anything about her past. And she would ask for prayer, but she could never talk about things. And it used to frustrate me, and I would pray for her, pray for her. Well, we eventually moved away, and probably a year after I, had not, I hadn't seen her, I had a dream. And she was in the dream. And I could see the time, the time in her life. I could see her. I could see the people involved. I could see the abuse, and I could see the torment. And it was this, some dreams that I have from God are very quick. But this dream, I felt like, you know, like I was just wrestling all night. I was watching a movie, and it just kept going on and on. And I was just like, oh, Lord, you know, this is awful. And I woke up with this heaviness upon me. I was like, I need to call her. And so I called her up, and I said, you know, look, I don't know what this is about, but this is what happened. And she sat quietly on the other end. And when I was done, she said, you know, Betty, she said, I've been seeing a therapist over the last few months and I'm going to leave to see her in 30 minutes and you basically I was crying out to God in my quiet time saying is this the day is this the day where I'm going to finally be set free where I can talk about it and I can share about it and she said because you just got it out <laughs> you basically just let it out it's out and I understand now that it's time. It's time. Thank you so much for calling me. And she was able to be set free from that bondage. And now she's um, recording amazing songs. She is, she's doing just great. And so I think it's really important to follow through, even though it can be uncomfortable sometimes with what you receive. Lastly, I want to go um, to a place that's a little uh, emotionally, I kept saying, God, this is going to be the hardest part of this message. Um, because it's about my father. My father passed away 12 years ago. And my mom's here today. So she's a, a witness to my, this story, these stories. And um, I want to share that I had three, three dreams. And I'm only going to share two of you, two with you and then kind of close out. But in the dreams, I just want um, you to understand that I was with my dad in all three dreams. He was always in a near-death place. He was about to die. I was with him. And my dad at this time was not a believer in Christ. He was not a believer all the way up until his death. And, um, and the dreams were prophetic, and they carried with them a promise. In the first dream... I was, my dad and I were being chased. There's a picture of a, a forest, and it looked a lot like this, maybe a little bit more dense in trees. But we were running hand in hand through a forest because we were being chased by a bear, a grizzly bear. And we were running as fast as we could, and then we came to this clearing where there were no trees. And we were totally exposed. There was no place to go. And this grizzly bear came running up to us, hind legs lifted up, pulling back its paw to ready to swipe us down dead, when all of a sudden, out of nowhere, comes this pure white wolf in between us, just comes out of nowhere, and looks at me like a Narnia moment and says, <laughs> run, I'm here to save you. And so I grab my dad's hands and we take off, and I'm looking back over my shoulder, and there's just blood all over the wolf. And I wake up. And I say, that was you, God. That, that wolf represented you, Christ. You came in when my father was about to die, and you came in to rescue us. You're going to do it. Because I used to cry out to God, save my father, save my father. I would share with him every story I could. I would, share, I would just pray for him. And my dad was a great debater, and he loved facts, but he had a really hard time with faith. And it was so frustrating. I just would cry out to God, Lord, I need to know that my dad's going to be okay. I need to know that he's going to know you <laughs> before he dies. So he gave me this dream. And I said, you're going to do it. You're going to come in and save him. And he said, yes. And he said, and I want you to share that. 
that dream with your dad. And I said, what? <laughs> I said, I don't know about your relationships with your father, but that was going to be a very <laughs> odd conversation. <laughs> and about bears and wolves. And <clears throat> but God knew what he was doing. Because my dad was a very science-minded, facts person. And so you can't argue a dream. Yes, it's abstract. But you can't say, no, you didn't have that dream. That's not factual. <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> the whole thing's true. Because it's mine. Okay? So God knew what, how to approach my dad. I, I thought it was a little odd. But he knew. <clears throat> and my dad's response to that dream, surprisingly enough, was, thank you, honey. That gives me hope. Because I think he wanted faith. It just was really hard. And so what I think is pretty amazing is in 1 Corinthians it says that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can conceive the thoughts of God. But he reveals them to us by his Holy Spirit. God wants us to know the things to come. He wants to enable us to do and to, to, to minister to people in ways that the world can't through his Holy Spirit. That's pretty awesome. We can hear things from God that the world can't hear. We have the spirit. We don't have the spirit of the world. We have the mind of Christ. And this reminds me of a testimony I heard of a Muslim man who for years cried out to Abba, or uh, Allah, excuse me, <coughs> Allah. And he couldn't hear anything. He never felt there an exchange of any kind. Never felt it. And he, he was so diligent, so diligent to pray. He just, there was this void. And then um, he became a Christian, and all of a sudden he could hear the voice of God. He could hear that voice because the Spirit was in him. So this last dream I want to share with you, I didn't share with my dad for obvious reasons, and you'll understand why. But in it, there was a snake, a green snake, very much like this one. And um, I was with my dad in the hospital, and I was standing by his bedside. And the snake was resting kind of on top of the end of his, like his feet area. And my dad was looking into the eyes of the snake as if he was in love with the snake. He was so entranced, so fixated on it. Nothing was going to take his gaze off of that snake. And as he was um, looking upon the snake, he didn't realize that the snake was coiling around his body and constricting and suffocating him. And when he finally realized what was happening, his eyes got so full of fear, and this powerful light from out of nowhere came into the room, smashed into the room, and I sat up in bed. And I said, God, I get it. After the third dream, I get it. You are going to come in. When my dad is about to die, you are going to come in like a bright light and reveal yourself to him. And I have this peace, you know, the Bible talks about a peace that passes our own understanding that guards our heart. For the next seven years, it didn't matter what kind of debate like, or conversation or whatever I got in with my dad, I was assured that God was going to save him. And it didn't matter because I had that guarding of the Spirit upon me. Well, fast forward to my dad's death. He was in the hospital and I was standing by his bedside. And I need to share this little piece of information. I'm not going to go into a bunch of details, so don't worry. But my dad loved his doctor. I would even say my mom would probably agree that his doctor was his savior. And that doctor was responsible for not only healing my, saving my dad, healing him from this, this disease. And he put all his trust in his doctor. And the doctor told him to take a pill. And that pill had been sitting on his, by his bedside for two hours. I said, Dad, you've got to take the pill. He said, I just can't. He couldn't swallow anymore. He just he really couldn't take anything in by this point. And um, I was like, okay. But wouldn't you know, his doctor comes into the room. My dad's scrambling to take that pill because he wants to be a good boy. <laughs> he wants to please his, his, his savior. So he starts taking it. He starts to choke. The doctor's standing at the end of the bed. He's looking at my dad. My dad's looking up at him. And I turn to my mom. My dad starts choking. I say, Mom, my dream is happening right now. Because I don't know if you're seeing the correlation, but the snake represents the medical field. And my dad loved his doctor. 
He was so entranced. He, that's, that's who was going to help him. The doctor's just mumbling. He's saying, I don't know what's happening. This shouldn't be happening. I don't know what's happening. He's just talking to himself. And then my dad passes out, goes into a coma, and the doctor leaves the room. And I'm like, God, where's the bright light? Where's that bright light? Where is it? Come on, come on. And my mom and I just start praying. We just start praying over my dad. And then within an hour, a friend doctor comes in. He hears about what happens. And he says, I heard what happened. I'm so sorry. He said, I need to share something with you. He said, I was in a coma a few years ago. And I could hear everything everybody was saying to me. I just could not respond. And I just feel like I need to share that with you. And he leaves. And I was like, we got to go to church. I was like, we got to take my dad to church right now. And I grabbed my guitar and I started playing every song I ever written to Christ. And we, my mom and I were praying in his ears. We were reading scripture. We were going to town. I had five other siblings who came sporadically throughout the next two days. And we took my dad to church. Did we not? <laughs> and we, we were just praying scripture over him. And we were just loving on him. And I believe he was in a place for a lot of those control issues that he dealt with before the coma were gone. And he was able to receive. And I do believe that God came in like a bright light and saved my dad. And I know he did. And when my dad passed away, I saw a vision. And I don't have time to go into it because it's like a 10 minute story. It's for another message on visions. <laughs> but my dad is in heaven with the Lord. And I'm so happy that he gave me that dream to sustain me all those years and through that very, very emotional experience. So in closing, some of you I know today are struggling with a family member, a spouse, a friend. You so desperately want them to know the love and truth of Christ. And I know that deep pain that comes along with that, that desperation and my prayer for you today is that God would, by in his mercy, give you that peace, give you either a dream, a vision, give you something that would help you walk through that so that you have that peace that guards your heart and that you have that hope. And there's a saying that Angie and I like to say all the time to people, it's not a matter of if they're going to come to the Lord, it's a matter of when, when they're going to come to the Lord and hold out hope. And I pray that God gives that to you. And so at this time, I just want to go over the next steps quickly um, with you. And again, these are scriptures that you can look up this week. I would also suggest that you start creating a devotional time with God before going to bed. <coughs> okay? Um, when you dream, pray about your dreams, write them down, and then also ask people about their dreams. Let's just be reminded that God speaks to us all the time. Some of you may say, like, well, I've never heard the voice of God. Maybe he's trying to speak to you in your dreams. I just never really thought about that. Okay? So I'm going to ask the worship and prayer team to come forward at this time. And um, the worship and the prayer team to come forward at this time. And I want to add why they're coming forward that 40 million people... 40 million suffer from sleep disorders. It is such a common issue. And quite frankly, I am sick of the church looking like the world. Because we have the power of God who can come and free us from this. And then we can proclaim it to those who don't know the Lord. And I know every week, I'm part of the prayer team, we get at least one person who says, please pray for my anxiety. Please pray for my anxiety. I can't sleep. I can't whatever. Okay? Enough is enough. It's time to deal with this. Okay? And um, I would suggest that you start to create, if this is you, okay, that you would start to create a devotional time before bed. It says in the Word that if you confess your sins to God, He is faithful to forgive you. So it's really important to, and, and cleanse you from all unrighteousness to take righteous thoughts into your sleep. It says what we sow, we reap. So make sure you're sowing to the right things because what we sow at night, 
or we reap at night what we sow. Okay, so sow to the spirit. In Proverbs 3, it says, When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. God wants to give us good, sweet rest. And we shouldn't be afraid of sleep or the dreams that come at night if we put our hope in Christ. And so at this time, I want to offer prayers up. Offer that you ask that you come forward if you have any kind of anxiety, any kind of sleep issues, anything that's keeping you from sleeping, from getting that good rest. If you have sleep paralysis, I know there's been people in this place that have sleep paralysis, night terrors, sleep apnea. If you have pain in your bones and you can't sleep because you're always uncomfortable, please come forward. This first song that I've asked the, um, the worship team to, to play is more of a meditational song. You're gonna be asked to stand, but I pray that you would pray for and intercede for those people who come forward. Would this be a time where we as a community are supporting the people who are getting prayer up here to be set free? To be set free. And then we'll go into our, our regular set of worship. But I really, I just want to just nip this thing. We need, to, we need to know that we have a Savior who came not only to save our souls, but to set us free from captivity now. Now. And I want those people to get the rest they need so they can they can hear the Lord more. Okay? So let this be a time of that. I also just want to point out, because this was something that came later, was if you have been involved in witchcraft of any kind, from tarot cards to uh, palm reading to anything like that, that will affect your sleep. Okay? And so if you've had dabblings in that, come forward. Okay? Confess that. Come forward. Be set free. Okay, so this is a time where you guys can come. You're being invited forward for prayer, ministry, and uh, let's just give it to the Lord. Amen. So if you could just stand with us for our meditational reading today.